as I sit here silently watching the moon above my head, I wonder at its beauty as its light it sheds, and how our ancient kith and kin on such beauteous nights also sat and watched and prayed in its softly healing light. How many others watched and thought of elders in the past who also sat and watched the moon on its glorious silver path. How many sat and prayed for peace in lands torn apart by strife, who sat and thought of wives and mothers in its softly healing light. How many in the future will also do this right of praying for a peaceful world on a softly moonlit night. And as I sit in wonder and contemplate its light, I bring together past and future on this present night and wish that in this strife-torn world of anger, fear and fright, we all can find an answer in its softly healing light. Hello and welcome back to the Ancestral Craft Podcast. If you've been here before, welcome back. This is now episode three, can you believe it? And if you haven't been here before, welcome. My name is Alex and I'm a gardener based here in Edinburgh, Scotland. And in my free time, I like to knit and spin and craft and forage and generally just tinker with my hands and get my feet stuck into the earth and I like to explore what it means um, for our craft to be passed down through generations and to keep stories and crafts alive by getting people involved in any aspect of craft, whether that's cooking, woodworking, knitting, spinning, um, gardening, all of the things. I hope to rekindle, if you will, some sort of inspiration to get involved with our hands and to reconnect to the earth. Yes, so it's episode three now and I can't believe it really. It's been a bit of a whirlwind and there's so many new faces constantly joining us here. And I just wanna say a big welcome and a big thank you to anybody new and anybody in the past who has left comments and shared and reached out to me in any way. And a big thank you to my Patreons who have given me so much support, um, which I'll get into later, but a big thank you to absolutely everyone. We've been having such fun over on Patreon, posting content for everybody and getting them involved in some of the deeper aspects with tutorials and full moon readings and all this kind of thing. I am drinking some heart tea on the topic of Patreon. This is a herbal blend that I created and I re recorded a tutorial on how to make it and about all the components and that is available if anybody is interested. And yes, it includes rose which is our herb of the month. So if you're interested in joining me on Patreon then please do. I'd like to say it's a lot of fun, but I'm completely biased. Um, but yes, what we do is I give you a herb of the month and a craft of the month. I also record monthly foraging dash forest walk videos, introducing you to the native plants that grow around me. I also record um, an instructional video for my berry tier members every month. And last month we explored pine needle basket making, which we made and I recorded a tutorial for that. And this month was a tutorial for how to make a heart, heart herbal blend. Um, so yes, it's a lot of content and I share recipes, seasonal things, um, what I'm working on, just little behind the scenes things as well. 
and yeah it, I wouldn't be able to do this without them because it allows me to take a day off a month to just really focus on my crafts and my podcast and things like that so yes please do consider joining me on Patreon um, you'd be more than welcome and you can join our little community where we're just we're just heart friends and we connect and we get to chat and it's really special so thank you to everybody who's supporting me and i just wanted to say that this this podcast aims to be a safe haven really for restless hands and loud minds really at times like this i i'm so aware of everything that's going on in the world and that's why i decided to share that poem by Yvonne. I can't remember her last name, maybe I wrote that down. It's by Yvonne Mayo. Yvonne Mayo, Moonshine, and that poem really touched me and I feel like it's very important for this time to remember the hope that we hold on to in this spring season and remember the good in humanity which is still very much present. Um, but yes, my heart and every part of me goes out to anybody suffering in any any way, not just in Ukraine, but throughout the whole world. I hope everyone can find some hope through the trees and through the ground when there might seem to be none. Um, but I'm aware that I'm speaking from a complete place of privilege. So yes, my heart goes out to you all. And I hope that this can bring you some joy out there to anyone struggling, if anyone has family members or is directly involved, then welcome and I'm giving you big warm hugs and wishes and my heart goes out to you every single day. So yes, we've got a lot to get on with. I've been quite busy. I haven't done a lot of knitting necessarily. I've kind of been my mind has been busy so I've been dabbling in bits and pieces and that's fine of course. <laughs> it's fine to be exploring lots of different things. So we've got a lot to cover, not necessarily a lot in the knitting section because there's a lot of sections I've realised. This podcast has a lot of interesting intersections but we'll get on with it and I'll put timestamps below for everybody if there's only one specific part you're interested in or if you want to stay here for the whole time that would be great please do stick around till the end though um or skip to the end up to you <laughs> um because i will be giving details on the retreats that i'm holding this summer which are so exciting so please do listen for that and i'd love to see you there and also to hear the winner of the giveaway for the spindle and the naturally dyed wool. Okay, so I guess we'll start with what I'm wearing. This is, I'll stand up a little bit, this is the Carcade Pulley by Tetti. You might know her, she's a very wonderful designer. I'll include all the links for patterns in the description as always. And this is a four ply jumper and it's got lateral braids across the yoke and it has, well, the pattern doesn't have bell sleeves, but I added bell sleeves and it's a cropped length jumper with, I don't know what this technique is called, but it's where you carry your floats across the front of the work as opposed to on the back and I really do love this jumper I don't remember the needle size I knit it in but that is available on Ravelry on the project page um, and it's knit in Nutiden I realize how much I knit in it when I record these podcasts because it's pretty much all the wool I talk about and it's not an exception today but this is their Oxalis colorway and this is from I think last year, early last year sometime, maybe June-ish, um, and it's a beautiful brownie red. It's a lot more red in person, but it, it's like Oxalis, um, 
yeah it's a very apt color name and I added some lateral braids on the sleeve as well yeah and I really love this one it's very comfy um I'm also wearing some socks which I'm not quite sure how I meant to show you <laughs> but I'll give it a go I'm wearing there we go there's a sock need to get on my yoga um <laughs> this is the vapor socks by helen stewart and these are lace work socks i don't know how well you can see that but i'm trying my best and they're knit in annabelle williams um four ply she's a naturally well a natural dyer based in the uk somewhere i want to say england um and i'm not sure what she dyed with i think it said Madden on the label, but I don't have it anymore because I knit these a while ago. And yes, that's a lovely pattern. Um, probably full of mistakes because I'm terrible at memorising the lace work patterns. But yeah, that was the last pair of socks I really made. And I haven't made any in a while. But yeah, I really do love those. I love the colour because they're green. What a surprise. <laughs> So yeah, what have I been up to? Like I say, I've been very busy on Patreon, recording extra content there. Been very busy gardening. It's that time of year where things are just building and building and you go from having, you know, enough work to having too much. <laughs> so it can be really easy to overwork yourself and to burn yourself out, which is actually what I did. Um, I haven't taken any time off work other than a week at Christmas since I started working as a full-time gardener in July of last year um, because I'm a bit of a workaholic but I've taken three days off um, which is how I'm recording this podcast because I wouldn't have had time otherwise um, but yes I've taken some time off to recharge to finish up some projects or to knit some more and to regather my thoughts, get re-inspired, connect to the earth as it's been the spring equinox. I had a lovely, lovely walk um, to Arthur's Seat, which is an old volcanic uh, rock structure in the middle of Edinburgh. It's a beautiful, beautiful site. Uh, so I climbed up there to see sunrise at 5 a.m. I think on the spring equinox and that was so precious. There's barely a soul in sight and to see the new sun just rising and shining so brightly it was really lovely and I carved some spindles while I was there which I'll show you later but yeah the spring equinox is here things are getting busy um, so yeah I've been it seems like only yesterday that I was recording in bulk content over on patreon where we crafted St. Bridget's crosses. Um, and I'll insert a picture of one of the crosses that my Patreons sent me a picture of that they made. Um, this is Nicole from the Gentle Knitting podcast. Um, and well, the Gentle Knitter podcast, what should I say? And she is in Canada, as you probably know. And she trekked all the way through the snow to find the rushes that she needed to make her cross. And it's little things like this that have given me a lot of hope and perseverance in the end of winter and the beginning of springtime where things were a bit dark. I just thought of Nicole trekking through the snow looking for these plants buried and going through that effort to to greet in spring, even though it was very unspring <laughs> where she was. So that made me very happy. So thank you, Nicole, for sharing that. Um, it was really, really wonderful to see. So yeah, that's pretty much what I've been up to. I've been busy planning retreats and doing content with Heal Scotland, which like I say, I'll talk about later. But yeah, I've just been little bits and pieces all over the place. So yeah, we'll probably just get right into it now. And I'm going to start with knitting because that's what most of you are here for. And then if you want to stick around for the other content, you can. But 
it is sort of knitting related the other stuff so I do recommend it but you don't have to if you don't want to so I'll start with the work in progress that I've been working on since last time and this is a long project <laughs> but I'm having a lot of fun and this is the Afton Sol jumper by Venke Rold, a Norwegian designer. And this is inspired by an old Swedish folk pattern. Looks like it could fit me, but it is actually quite a bit bigger. And this is for my partner, Philip. And it's been up and down. <laughs> it's had its moments. I had to re knit it. I started it at Christmas time and I got to about here. Then I got home and he came back from Sweden and I tried it on and he said it was fine but it really wasn't, it was too tight. So I ripped it back and started again, went up a size and then made it to here and then I knit to there and then realised I'd made a mistake in the pattern work, had to rip it back <laughs> and then started again. Um, and it's still got some issues. I started the neck band but I didn't like it. Um, it's like a double folded neckband, but it doesn't have you do any decreases and it's not ribbed, so it's very bulky and loose. So I'm gonna rip that out and maybe just make up my own neckband that I think looks better. But this is knit in the round um, up until the shoulder seams, and then you have to kind of cast the front neck off and then well you put the stitches on hold then you knit these bits because this is steaked you knit around back and forth the shoulder stitches and then just as you're nearly done you cast um, the back stitches off onto some scrap yarn and then you do the same for this side and then you have to seam the shoulders together. This doesn't make any sense and trust me when I was reading the pattern it didn't make much more sense so I'm sorry you'll just have to struggle along with me here. That's the back, it looks pretty much the same as the front. It is lovely and now that I'm holding it up on camera it really does show up quite well. So the neck band is steeked, so are the armholes, I'll put a picture of the steak um, because I hand stitched, I hand stitched it because I didn't really want to faff on with my sewing machine to be honest because I thought it would just get caught and it would be a mess but uh I just hand stitched the reinforcement and there's not there's one stitch there's one steak stitch down here so you've got no room for error and this is actually my first time steaking something. So I was terrified about cutting my knitting because I knew if I messed it up, I'd have to redo all of the color work, which I wasn't thrilled by because it's just been a long project. <laughs> so I've got the body done, minus the neck band, which I'll redo. And I've got the sleeves to go. I cast on a sleeve last night. Well, I've got a cuff not got that much and this is knit with Ull Centrum which is a Swedish wool uh, where is it from I want to say Erland I think that's what it is and he chose the colors stone grey and anthracite and this is a fingering weight wool I think they describe it as sport but it's a fingering weight wool, don't know if you can see. And it's lovely, it's really lovely. It's very rustic, but when it knits up, it's soft. It's not too scratchy. And it's really great for color work and the steaking because it's quite sticky. So yeah, that's where I am with this. It's been quite hard to understand the pattern. I don't know if that's because I'm new to all this type of construction. I feel like this, the way this is constructed is quite old fashioned, not in a bad way, just in a, I've never done that before and I've never seamed anything 
let me see if I can show you this seam up close. That's the shoulder seam here, which isn't perfectly matched up, but it's close enough. So yeah, I've been working on that. And I've been working on this pretty religiously because I want to get this done really soon. It's going to be too late for him to wear it this year because it is warming up. But I like to knit um, on winter wear all year round. I don't really like to wear knitwear in the summer. And instead of not knitting in the summer, I just knit for winter, which is fine for me. It's not for everybody, but I like to prepare for the colder months. Um, so yeah, this is the, I don't know if I said, the Afton Sol. Yeah, I did say that, I just remembered. Um, <laughs> this is the Afton Sol by Venke Rold. Um, and yeah, it's coming along, it's nearly done. I'm gonna aim to get this done in the next few weeks and give it to him, but I'm very happy with that. So my next finished object are the Moreland Mitts by Tanya Barley. And these are knit in Nutiden in their transparent colourway. Oh, get them on like this. And they are really, really lovely and cosy and warm. And these are the very first pair of mittens that I've successfully made because I've almost made mittens about three times before this and then just never finished them because I wasn't loving them, I guess, or they weren't turning out right or I just had a bit of a mitten curse and I could never finish a pair, but here they are, my very first pair of mittens, and I love them, and I've been wearing them a lot, and it's really beautiful yarn, and they're very, very easy to make. I was a bit intimidated by the uh, texture work on the front but it was so well explained. The pattern has diagrams on how to make these little, I want to say bobbles. I guess they're sort of bobbles. And yeah, they were really fun and really quick to knit. They're knit up um, on four millimeter needles. I don't know what that is in the US size, but four millimeters. So that makes it super quick because you, the yarn is held double, so you get quite a chunky fabric. And I really love them, and I've been wearing them a lot. And I've been trying to get everybody else to love mittens as much as I do. But alas, it hasn't happened. So the second finished object I have, well, I think this is the only one other than the Moreland mitts are another pair of mittens because I got a bit uh, hooked on the, the mitten train and I wanted to make more and there was a test call put out by Fox and Wolf uh, Knitting Designs for a pair of mittens called the Bramble Mittens and I love them a lot. Oh, I keep picking up my tea and then never drinking it. Um, <laughs> these are the bramble mittens and these are very special because I knit them in my hand spun and I have one skein left of the hand spun that I used so here we are this was the little tester that you saw in episode one I think of the yarn that I spun and it's a really lovely yarn it's a DK weight and it's fiber from Honor Roquer, but it's there uh, when they were selling bags of their fiber for the colors. And this is the Oath colorway. And I carded this into bats, no, Rolags. Carded it into Rolags and spun it up into a three ply using um, the chain ply method. And this is what I got. It has a cable on the cuff. So what you do is you knit the cable. It's knit this way. So you're knitting a band of the cable and then you pick up your stitches along the edge of it and then you knit vertically. 
And yeah, it's an interesting construction. I've never made a mitten this way with the thumb on like the front of, so it's on the front instead of uh, increases for the side. So these ones have the thumb on the side and these ones have it on the front. And I think I prefer it on the side personally. So when I knit the first one up, I realized I didn't really like the way they fit me. And I was quite disappointed at first. Um, and I felt a bit unmotivated to finish the second one. But then I realized that they fit my partner really well. I'll wear them for demo anyway. But they're quite wide. I did meet Gage. Um, so I'm not sure why they're, they're quite wide. Um, but uh, I also don't quite love the way it gathers at the front with the thumb on the front. Um, I don't know if that's just this construction or just this pattern. Maybe I need to um, experiment a bit more with some other ones. But they are beautiful and they fit my partner's hands a lot better because I have very tiny hands um, and they're quite narrow um, but his hands are wider and they fit well. So this is like a kind of unisex pair that he can wear and I can wear in the winter. So it's my first like shared object with somebody but it's quite nice. We'll have lots of little warm accessories to have by the door I think. Um, which was quite inspired by Inga from Knitting Traditions as she has at her cabin she has a lot of little um, accessories that people can wear when they visit and I thought that was really nice um, so I wanted to do the same okay so oh another thing to mention about that this is how close I was at losing the game of yarn chicken that's how much I had left of that first skein that I spun not much, just made it all good. Um, the next object is this one. Now this is not my usual colour, but I do really like it. This is the, how do you say it now? Because it's not said the way you think it is. This is the Hechwa. Hecho, I want to say, um, pattern by, what's her name, Frida Uxap, Uskap, Frida Uskap, and yeah, Hecho, and it's a yoke um, jumper, knit top down, and I haven't worked on this for a while, although I do really like it, I like knitting with blue it's a bit out of my comfort zone but it makes me very happy and I got to splitting the sleeves and then I stopped because I tried it on and I realized it was a bit too tight so you can see that it does actually fit me quite well like it does look like it would fit me and it does technically but um, I have a lot of jumpers that are quite um, not tight fitting but they fit me just right and I really wanted one that was a bit bigger because um, I tend to gravitate towards them more. So I'm going to rip this back and I'm going to knit the next size up. But this is also knit in Nuti Den. And I've been using scraps that I had from other projects. This one isn't a scrap. I have a jumper weight, a uh, jumper quantity, sorry, of this blue. And the colour work is very subtle, it doesn't show up very well, but I love subtle changes in colour because for me they're the colours that I see in nature that kind of catch my eye. I see colours that are so subtle and you might not notice them, but when you get up close you can really see. That's what I love. So this, this blue, I should have written down the names. I don't remember what the blue is. This this like grey blue here, I don't know what this one is either because it was just a little sample that they send sometimes in their packages. So 
sometimes they'll just send you um, with your order like a tiny bit of another one maybe if they've got extra. This one is Offering of Trees and this peach is Between Petals and the uh, like the neutral whitish colour is transparent so that's the same colour as what I had left over from these. And yeah, I do actually really like the colours, but I just haven't finished it because of the size. But I will finish this after I've done the Afton Sol um, jumper for Philip. I will finish this one, I promise. Uh, I don't like to have things that are unfinished. And I also don't like to work on lots of things at once. It makes me very stressed <laughs> and I really like to kind of focus on one project and really connect with it and I like enjoying the slowness of knitting one thing at once. Um, sometimes I'll knit two things at once, usually it'll be a smaller item like an accessory and a jumper, but knitting two jumpers at once I just can't do it, it will, it just won't get done um, because I'll never truly get into the flow of one if I'm constantly jumping back and forth. So. That's how I work, that's how I'm doing it. Yes, I'm a slow knitter, but I love that. I, I really enjoy embracing the slowness of this craft. Um, it's not meant to be fast. It can be, some people are very fast, but that's not me. So no point dwelling on it really. But I love the pattern, it's so straightforward and it's, I think it's knit on like five millimeters or something. So it is a quick knit, it's held double. Um, that's the main color I'm using. I just kind of felt a calling to blue, which is fine. Um, I think I kind of suit blue. It's not necessarily my color, but You'll have to let me know if you think <laughs> blue's a bit of a stretch for me. I don't know. Um, rude horns outside. Okay, so I think that's all I'm working on. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not a lot. You've got two whips, um, but that's probably about the extent of it. Um, I'm going to focus on finishing the Afton Sol first because um, then it's nice and out the way and I can feel the satisfaction of knowing that's done um, especially because the project's been a bit difficult and time consuming I think it'll be a real uh, weight lifted to get that off the needles but I have been making plans for cast-ons in the future um, which I'll talk about um, after the rest of my finished objects in my other crafts um, and you can stick around if you want to hear about future projects. So the next thing I'm going to talk about are my spinning projects and this is a very exciting segment because due to my support on Patreon I was able to buy my first full fleece and this might seem a bit lame to some people but I find it very exciting. So I've been really in the spinning mood um, and I've been finding it quite fun. This is one of the first skeins I spun. I'm trying to get through the fibre stash that I have and one of the fibres I have is Black Cheviot and this was a 50 gram um, packet of raw fleece that I got from Perth Yarn Festival last year and it's from the Hawkshaw Sheep um, Company and they will be at the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase on the 2nd of April, which I'm going to, which is very exciting. Um, but yeah, this is Black Cheviot and this is just a natural colour. And you can see it's got beautiful greys and browns. It's, it's a beautiful wool. And this is just a four ply, by that I mean fingering weight I think is what you'd call it and but it's actually two plies which can be a bit confusing but 
it's two singles spun together. Um, let's see if I can get a good... I'll insert some videos or pictures as a close-up, but it's a relatively thin yarn. And I've been really inspired by the Kia Spode podcast, the lovely Kia. Um, she's been spinning a lot of her stash and it's inspired me to do the same. And she's knitting these lovely socks for her husband with very natural shades that she spun on her drop spindle. And I just love that. Um, I've been getting a lot, of more, a lot more drop spindle love um, in my life and I've been using them more because it's, sometimes it's just nice to not use your spinning wheel and just to really be slow with it but that's one skein that I spun the other skein I spun is um, from fibre that I had from John Arbin I bought this fibre when I was first starting out spinning and it is alpaca and polworth so it's a wool and alpaca wool blend and this is in the color cappuccino and this is very soft it you can see it's just very drapey and that's because of the alpaca content and this is a dk weight um and i haven't decided what to make with it yet i wanted to make a headband but it's very close to my hair colour so I'm not sure if that would look very good um, who knows but yes that is a lovely alpaca one that I've spun so you can see I have a bit of a thing for brown I really like shades of brown but I'm trying to be more adventurous but also respect the things I love so that's the finished skeins that I have I also spun a sample, and when I say sample, I mean sample. It's tiny, it's very cute. This is also from a 50 gram pack of raw fleece that I got from Hawkshaw Sheep at Perth Yarn Festival. And the reason this is so small is because when I bought this fleece, I didn't really know what I was looking for, and I just got the sample bag. Um, but now I know that you should check what you're buying because this fleece had a lot of scurf, I think you call it. I keep forgetting the name of it, it just disappears. Um, but it's basically uh, kind of when the sheep has a skin issue and it's in the, the fleece and it's really hard to card out um, even after you wash it. It's very oily and it doesn't quite remove itself. And it had a lot of it to the point where I tried spinning it and it just didn't look good at all. So I kind of picked out the pieces of the fleece that were still usable and spun a sample anyway just to try and even though it's tiny I got some lovely wool from it. I just spun it into a, a two-ply fingering weight yarn but it's so soft, it's so soft and this is Hebridean and when I go to the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase um, on the 2nd of April. I'll look out for some Hebridean from her and get some because I would love to make a project with this. It's incredibly soft and lovely to spin minus the, the issues I had. So yeah, that's another sample. There's a lot of spinning stuff. But I will take my time and go to the next thing. The next thing I've been doing is spinning some more of this Shetland roving. Again, this was also from Hawkshaw Sheep at Perth Yarn Festival. It's very squidgy and this is woolen um, prepared so it's all the fibres are in different directions which make it very squidgy and lovely. Um, but yeah, you do sacrifice a bit of the consistency of the yarn when you prepare it that way. But I've been spinning it on one of my top whirl spindles. 
and I've got a bit more. It's not a lot, I just kind of pick it up sometimes, but I'm aiming to have drop spindles quite readily available, so if I'm a bit bored I can just spin some stuff up. But it's been a lot of fun and I'm really enjoying it and I think there's a lot of freedom when you spin woolen because it does force you to let go a bit of um, your perfectionism. <laughs> and this is a lovely spindle. I can't remember where I bought it, um, so I can't give you that information. But it spins really beautifully, really balanced. And I've been really enjoying spinning on a drop spindle recently. So that is one project that is on the spindle. So I decided to try my hand at some whittling, so wood carving, and I didn't really know where to start because this is not something I have any skill with whatsoever. And I remember being quite bad at woodwork in school, to be honest. I remember making a pair of bookends and I made them backwards, so they didn't really look very good. But I tried. I always tried with craft in school, but woodwork was something that just completely evaded me. So I asked um, my partner's friend, Linus, for some advice on what knife to get or what wood I should use, etc. And told me to get um, a brand of knife called Moraknev, I think is how you say it, I don't know. It's Swedish um, and if Philip was here he'd joke that everything um, well made is Swedish but... So I got a little whittling knife and that looks a bit threatening so I won't show you that for too much longer. But it's been, it's a really lovely knife, very sturdy and I used two types of wood. The first one I tried was hazel. So hazel wood is very distinctive. And I got this because a client that I work for has a Coralus avalana contorta tree, which is common hazel, but it's a cultivar. And contorta um, means that it's, it's kind of contorted I guess is the best way you could say it. I'll insert a picture of um, contorta here and basically it's cultivated so that the stems are spirally and with all kind of cultivars you can get reversion so um, the plant will naturally want to revert back to its original colour or shape or whatever so you get um, these long straight um, hazel shoots coming from the base of the plant and we have to cut them out um, because it looks a bit odd and that's what people like. I'd probably leave it if it was my garden but it's not my garden so <laughs> we cut them out. So that's how I got the hazel wood and the other wood I used was um, from a rowan tree that had come down in the wind um, and this it's a deeper colour of wood, which you'll see when I show you the spindle. And I started with the hazel wood because um, I thought it'd be easier because it was fresh. Um, so there was still a lot of moisture in the wood, which made it quite easy to cut. And I'm spinning some Shetland on it. This is just white natural Shetland wool that I got. Um, from I think it's Wish You Were Here, a bit of a sheep pun there. And I made a Jalgen spindle, which is the Scottish spindle. So I carved this. It's not beautiful. Well, I think it is because I'm biased and I think, yeah, I don't want to say I don't like it. I do love it. And it has a crossbar at the bottom and a notch at the top so you can do your half hitch. And I've been spinning up the Shetland wool here. 
and it's really lovely and it spins quite well I was worried because I know when you carve your own spindles if you don't get the center of gravity right it just doesn't spin but this one actually spins quite well it's a bit rocky but for a first attempt that's not bad and it spins for quite a while as well which is ideal so this is my first hand carved spindle and it's been very fun to delve into crafting um, with wood I think it's really inspiring um, people who can do this effortlessly uh, with their hands it's just it blows my mind because it's not easy it really it really kind of hurts your your fingers because you're putting a lot of force into kind of carving it away and yeah it just uses a different part of your hand I feel and it can get quite tense but I did it in two sittings this one and it turned out nice so I'm happy with that I'll put that there and the second one that I made was the one that I made when I was up Arthur's seat for spring equinox at sunrise. And this is a slightly different spindle. This, I kind of saw pictures of spindles like this online and I wasn't sure if it was meant for spinning, uh, you know, in the air or if you could use this to s support spindles, so have it on, oh, it's not that easy to do in the air, but spin it on a basin of some sort and draft. I like using it in the air because I find it a lot easier um, to spin that way. But this is a very nice spindle too. This one isn't as well balanced because there's a natural, I don't know if you can see, but there's there's a sort of natural curve in the wood. And this one was carved from the Rowan. And yeah, so how I did this is I, I carved it away first and then I sanded it down to get rid of the hard edges, which were, you could see on this spindle. And I'll insert pictures um, so you can see up close. But, um, I sanded it down and then I put a beeswax wool polish, wool polish? Wood polish, shows where my brain is, um, onto it. And I really love how it has this natural variation from the center of the wood back out to the outside of the wood. And it has lovely colors in it. The hazel is quite, it's quite one note. It, um, it's a beautiful white color, um, but this one has more of a warm tone to it. And this one's really fun. I, I, love, I love spinning with this one, but I, I haven't done much in it. I just spun this as a sample so you could see how it's used. Um, and yes, I'm trying to think if there's anything else about this. I don't think so, but it was quite simple. I'm not going to record a tutorial because I had no clue what I was doing and I'm not qualified in any respect to do that. Um, but I did enjoy it. It was very fun and I think woodwork is something that I want to get better at. I'd love to whittle some more things. I really want to make a spoon, like really badly. It's, it's my new obsession to the point where I was searching around the tool shed at work well, at one of my jobs, um, seeing if we had an axe to chop up some wood because I have, I have like logs. I can't show you now because it's under the chair and it's really inconvenient. Um, but I have logs and what I've seen online is people chop it first into like a spoon kind of amount. They don't use a branch. Or if they do have a branch, they use an axe to chop the branch in half. Um, so I don't really have the tool I need in order to chop it into uh, a blank, I think they call it. 
um, and then they use the axe to kind of get rid of most of the material which makes sense because the whittling knife is really good for the finer details and taking little bits off um, but uh, yeah it's I wouldn't want to take a log and then whittle a spoon out of it I think my hands would be very upset with me um, but yes if I can get a hold of an axe that's my next project or perhaps I'll just you know do the sensible thing and order a wo like a wooden blank for a spoon which is just where it's already been cut into the general shape and then you can just whittle it from that but I like to do things from scratch but I might have to just um you know give in and take the easy way um which is you know we'll see we'll see Okay, the last, oh, not the last spinning thing. See, I have that much that I'm like, surely that's the last thing, but it's not. This is um, a fleece I showed you last time, but I've washed it. So this is washed fleece. And this is the croissant fleece. Sounds like I'm saying croissant in a really weird way, but I don't know how else to say it. Um, Q-U-E-S-S-A-N-T. So pronounce it as you will. Croissant is how I'm saying it. Um, this is so soft and it's so beautiful and it's got a lovely sheen to it. And the reason I haven't spun this up yet is because I feel like in order to bring the true character out of this wool, I want to prepare it worsted. So to prepare it worsted, I'd need combs, I've seen people use carders by just pulling it through the teeth, but not rolling it. Um, but I don't know if I'm gonna do that. Um, I do want some wool combs anyway, because spinning is surely becoming the way I like to do things. I'm quite enjoying spinning things up for projects, having that longer time to be with a project. Um, and I have some projects in the future that I'll be spinning wool for which I will talk about. But yeah, so if anybody, the reason I'm mentioning this is because if there are any spinners out there who know of some good wool combs, um, because I've looked online and there's so many varying price points, it's a bit intimidating. So if anyone has any recommendations for wool combs that I can use or order that are easy to access from the UK, then please let me know and I will get some and I can have this for next time. But I really, sometimes wool just gets you and this is a fleece that I love the colour, I love the, the tones in it, I just love the feeling of it. Like I wish you could feel this, it's lovely. Um, this was also from Hawkshaw Sheep um, and if I can get more of it I probably would in the future. Okay, last fleece, and it's a big one. So, with the support from Patreon, I was able to buy full fleeces, and I recorded the behind the scenes footage for that for Patreon members on how I washed it, how I sorted it, how I combed it, etc. And this is what I have. This is a fourth, a quarter of the fleece rolled up and I bound it together just for storage. Um, there is a lot of it and I have another fleece. So I got two fleeces, um, which is fine. Um, this is Bora fleece, which is a Scottish island breed. So it's, it's quite rare and um, it's unimproved for meat production and wool production. So it's a very rustic, um, long uh, haired sheep. And it's beautiful, isn't it? It's really lovely. Um, and I'll insert some pictures of uh, what it looks like because I have some close up pictures. Um, I feel like I, I just want to be a cat, you know, when cats do that when they're trying to get comfy. I do that when I'm like holding my fleece. Um, 
yeah so this is the natural white kind of colorway and I have spun up some samples well sample sample one sample because I want to make the Vor I think it's Vor uh, shawl by Nina Pomorenke who is also a lovely podcaster and I adore her patterns and I'll have a picture of the pattern here so what I imagine is having spun the wool it's a four ply shawl so I've been carding them into row legs here's some loose ones and I've been following my usual sample process of spinning the single then spinning it into the plies and then the unwashed no the washed sample here the reason I don't have the washed sample here is because I knit it straight up into a swatch and this is the swatch I need to block out my face so it focuses on something else and it's really lovely it's quite a I want to say like a hairy sheep fleece like it's it's quite hair like is what I mean it's very long and the hair is poke out so it's got a nice halo to it which you can't really see I'll try get a close-up but yeah spun that up into sample and I got gauge for the shawl I just need to dye it so my plan is I realise I've got a lot of plans, I've been saying them out loud, um, but it's fine, we'll just, we'll just do all the projects, but to me I can do lots of different things preparing for projects, so I can dye the wool, spin the wool for different projects, but I can't knit more than two projects at once, so I'm a bit chaotic until it comes to the actual knitting. So yeah, that's that fleece, the natural white bore spinning up lovely and obviously I'll have way more um, than just a shawl quantity so in the future I'll spin it up into something else but I'm gonna wait so I don't want to just spin up the quantities that I have in case I decide I want to use it for another project and I've already spun it into the wrong weight of yarn or the wrong preparation I really like to have all of the stages um, thought out and just it's just less waste that way um, and I should mention that these fleeces are from the island farm shop and they're a lovely farm in Orkney um, it has a nice little poster on it but they basically protect rare sheep breeds and they have Shetland, Bore, Hebridean and Icelandic sheep and they are lovely and the, sh the fleeces are very reasonably priced they're very good quality um, this white one has no issues there's no scurf there's no um, there's not a lot of organic matter in it uh, very easy to wash it's very gentle this one it feels like this was from a sheep that was very calm and didn't roll around in the dirt which leads me to my second fleece and this sheep was naughty because it is filthy it must have been rolling around in the mud for hours a day because even though this is washed oh my god when I'm carding it my clothes are covered in twigs and leaves and all the stuff and this one does have a slight issue with some scurf on the sections so this will need a lot more work in terms of um, taking those bits out before I card and spin them so I'll have to go through this and sort it again because you couldn't really see the scurf before I washed it so I couldn't separate it before then um, but I will separate it soon but look at this it is fabulous 
and I love this colour and it, it's quite variating so you can see the tips are a bit bleached so it's a dark brown but the tips are a bit more blonde and it has really fun bits of grey and white so it's got a lot of variegation but I just thought this sheet was very fun <laughs> it's just crazy like all these colours in one fleece it's very cool um so I again have a plan for this fleece so where do I have the book did I bring the book yes I did I want to make the East Wind jacket um, and this is by Emily Foden and it's in her Knits About Winter book. I'm trying to get a picture, here's some pictures without showing pattern. So it's a jacket um, for the snow and the cold months and I want to make it out of the, uh, the brown fleece and then I'll use the white fleece and dye it for the interest on the pocket. So the inside of the pocket is a different colour and then there's a different colour around the neck. So my plan is to use this, which you can't see at all because it's a dark colour and uh, it's not showing up but I will insert some footage as well. But it knit up into a beautiful sample, which you can't see at all. Um, and it has the natural greys in it, as well as the brown. Um, and this is, uh, I wanna say DK, it's DK weight yarn. And it's held with a strand of mohair. Um, I haven't got any mohair that I could sample it with, but, um, it does have a natural halo by itself, so I am wondering if maybe I could get away with um, not having a strand of mohair. Because um, it would be really nice if it was just the natural fleeces. And I really like the idea of making this coat in my first fleeces, because it's going to feel... I just imagine wearing it in the winter and feeling very connected to the whole process. and it feels special that it's from Bore because Bore are present on Barmolloch Farm which is a permaculture farm and healing centre up on the west coast of Scotland that I'm doing a lot of work with um, and they have Bore sheep so I get to see them a lot and they're so beautiful and I feel very connected to their wild spirit um, so yeah that's the sample for that one that was the sample for the other colour of the fleece and hopefully I've figured out to put pictures. But yes, so there are my fleeces and my samples and I'm very excited to knit these up. Um, it's really interesting knitting with them because of like all the lanolin. So I'm not used to knitting with um, the natural grease most wool has a very low lanolin content but because I'm spinning it it's really useful to have the lanolin left in because the grease just kind of helps the wool spin up and then when you wash it so this is washed I did wash this one that bus is so loud oh my god um we'll try ignore that and I washed it to get rid of the lanolin, well not all of it but some of it um, afterwards and it bloomed lovely and it's it's a really nice wool, it's very soft but um, hard wearing, like you can tell it's not like merino soft but it's it's got some strength to it. Okay, what else did I want to make? While I've got this book out, I'll probably just mention some other patterns in here that I'd love to make in the future, other than the East Wind. 
which will be a long time coming because it's a lot of wool that I'll need to spin up but I'm in it for the long haul. I'd really love to make some of her socks and her Persephone mitts so I'm on the mitten train like I said before and I'd really love to make these mittens. Um, they seem really basic. Maybe I will spin up some fibre for that. Maybe I'll have some fibre in mind. It could look really nice in uh, this, this Shetland Moritz. Um, I think it would look quite nice for this pattern. We'll see. I have a lot of time to change my mind. And I will. I know I will. And then I also want to make... I want to make everything in this book, to be fair, but the ones that I'm prioritising <laughs> are her socks as well. So she has lovely sock patterns in here. And I'd like to make some more socks because I haven't in a while and I really miss it. I do like socks. Um, so I will work on choosing the pairs and I'd love to make some hand uh, spun socks. Um, that would be a little bit more thought would have to be put into it to make the socks really strong, but I'm hoping that I'll figure it out. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll do what Kia's doing. Um, she's making these socks for her husband, like I say, and they're very, um, they're using a lot of scraps and their colour work, she just makes it up. And I, I love her creativity. She just loves to use things up and be creative and she's never constricted to patterns or any of this. She just makes it work and that's just a testament to how amazing her knitting skills are. Um, yeah, okay. Knitting, spinning, check. <laughs> the spinning section was quite long. So if you're not into spinning, I'm sorry. Um, the next thing is basketry. So I've been making some more pine needle baskets And I recorded this, like I say, for Patreon. So this is the basket I made for Patreon. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's a very cute shape and has a little lid that we made. And yes, yeah, so that was available for very level tier. Um, very tier. I don't need to say level tier. Um, very tier members have access to an instructional video a month and the behind needle basket was last month. So if you want stuff like that in the future, I would recommend joining my Patreon. I don't have time really to record this in my free time and that's why I um, use Patreon because that way the money they give me allows me to take a couple of days off work a month and I can work on content like this instead, which is very fun and I'm very grateful to be able to do that. Um, so yes, that's the first little basket. The second little basket is more of a bowl. And I'm using this to hold some little bits and bobs. This is just quite a simple one. And then I have the stacking stitch here. And then on the rim, I did a decorative border. Um, and this just has my weaving shuttle, my very poor first attempt at tablet, tablet weaving, which I will show you if I can remember which way is the right way. So I used Jameson's for this, just some scraps I had to try out my ankle loom and actually it doesn't look as bad on camera it looks worse in person <laughs> um, and it was just a very simple pattern I don't remember what the pattern was called but I followed a YouTube tutorial on how to do it the tensioning's all weird um, but what happened is you can see this is not the same pattern <laughs> 
is I tried to do this while listening to podcasts or watching TV and I lost track of where I was in the pattern and I had no idea how I was meant to be able to tell which cards I'd just turned and which part I was at. Um, so it didn't sync up. Um, but it was a good first attempt. It was so fun. Uh, I will be doing it again. I want to make one with my plant dyed yarns. I want to make a very colourful one. This was just, I didn't want to use precious expensive yarn. So that's what it's meant to look like. That's what it ended up looking like. You can see just the mess here. Um, but yeah, it was really fun and I'm gonna do it again in the future. I just need to find some time for that. Um, but I do think tablet weaving is in my future. I love the process of it. It feels very cool. And I have these cards, which I got on Etsy. They're very beautiful wooden cards and yes that's what I've been storing in this little bowl so yes baskets check um okay natural dyeing <laughs> I'm gonna pause this video and get another cup of tea because I'm parched and I will talk about my natural dyeing stuff and hopefully you're still sticking around. <laughs> okay, natural dyeing. First ones that I've been doing, I have a, so I've been collecting a lot of plant material from work as always. There's a big stash. I've got eucalyptus leaves, eucalyptus berries. I've got, um, uh, larch cones, I've got some more alder cones, I've got a lot, um, which I haven't got around to using, um, but it stores really well, so it doesn't really matter. But the first one I did was using alder cones. So this was the first vat, and this was the second vat. And this is a very lovely colour. It's technically brown again, but it's an interesting brown. It's not a brown I usually wear and I do quite like it. Um, I love if I had a sweater quantity of this, but I don't. Um, it's just the one skein that I got and this is on Wooly Knit Base. I just buy, I'll either buy stuff from the charity shop like old cones of wool or Jameson's cones as well. They're really good. Any basically four ply fingering weight yarn is what I'll buy because that's what I use most so that's what I dye on. So that was the first bat and I steeped the cones and the catkins sorry and the cones so I used both um, for about nearly a week to be honest because they're quite hard and you want to let a lot of the natural colour come out. And then I boiled it up for a couple hours on like a medium heat and then I added my wool. And this isn't mordanted. So basically the general rule when you're natural dyeing is if you're using something like um, twigs, cones, bark, things like that, um, wooden things. So the plant um, produces a lot of tannins in that type of um, material. So tannins help uh, the colour stick to the wool, so you don't need a mordant. Um, so that's the first one. Then I added this skein just to use up. There wasn't much dye left at that point, um, so I just dipped it in here, which is, it isn't white for sure. There is colour to it. Let me get you this one. And you can see there is colour to that. Um, but yeah, they're lovely. The next one I did was from Berberis. So Berberis is a plant. This one was Berberis darwinii and it was something that I pruned at work. Similar story to all the other ones. And 
this was the first time I used grey wool and I'm sad that I only used a little bit to try because I love the colour it turned. But this was it on, um, what do you call it? Just mordanted white wool. It's, it's yellow but it's more green really. Um, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It is green. Have anything to compare it to but when I used grey wool it turned this color and it turned it turned the grey like a beautiful green and I prefer this color to this color this color I have no idea what I'll do with it but um, this color I do love it but I only have a little bit and this is just from a grey fingering weight cone that I got in a charity shop. I think it's Shetland. I don't know because there's not a label. But the person in the charity shop seemed to think it was Shetland. So that is Berberis. And the great thing about natural dyeing is you can just get creative. Um, there's really no... There's no wrong way to do it. Just boil up some plants and see what colour you get. Um, as long as you're safe with toxic substances, there's really not much you can do wrong. So that's alder cones, barbarous, and then the next one was onion skins. And these are lovely. I can't believe that people just chuck out their onion skins because this colour is amazing. This is like pumpkin orange and I'm so inspired by this colour, it's really lovely and this was just from about half a big pan full of onion skins that I bought, well I soaked them for half a week then I boiled them up in the same way I do usually and that is what I got. So bright, so bright and then the second skein that I dipped in still had a lot of colour so I'll hold up the white again, just so you can see. Um, that's two skeins. And then the third skein, I added iron to the bath. So I dipped it in what was left from these two. Then I added some iron water and that dulls the color. In general, iron will darken or dull the color down. So this is a nice beige and it just takes away that yellow edge that these have and makes it, it's almost like, I don't know, it's like a soft caramel, like it's really, it's really nice. So that's onion skin. So there, all the things that I've naturally dyed. Um, like I say, I have more material, but I haven't got round to it. Um, but what I do want to do soon is cast on a project using my naturally dyed wool. I've got a big basket full now, um, but I haven't found the pattern that I want to knit with. So if you have any suggestions of patterns that would work really well with some uh, four ply Jameson's Shetland kind of style wool, then put them in the comments and I will probably cast that on at some point. But I do love these colours together. I could go forever putting colour combinations together because I think all naturally dyed wools just look good together. It's just amazing. So yeah, that's my naturally dyed wool. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was some cast-ons that I'm thinking about. And there's a few that I want to cast on and the first one is so I talked about the Vor shawl which is one and if you want to see any of these patterns they're in my Ravelry queue which you can see I believe if you go on my Ravelry account which will be in the description. So that shawl is one I want to um, cast on and I want to dye that with nettles the wool that I spin I want to dye that with nettles to have a nice green shawl with the botanical work on the bottom, which you might have seen when I put the picture in. And in the recent update for Nutiden, I got 600 grams. I don't often buy wool, 
which people might not think if they know me, but by knitting standards, I don't buy a lot of wool. So in their recent update, they had this colour called Hüfte. Um, and it's, they describe it as a grey yellow. This wool is being very handy recently <laughs> to show the contrast. So, white Hüfte. <laughs> And I love it. I love it. It's like, because it's that grey tone, it's slightly different than what I usually wear, which is like a very warm green. This one's a bit of a cooler green. And I want to knit the Versal. I think it's the Versal, yep. And that pattern is by... What's her name? Albiona McLaughlin, I think is her name. All the description will have the links. But I want to knit the Versal because I really want just a turtleneck oversized jumper. And I think this is perfect for it. Um, I was debating whether to make a cabled jumper or something more textured. But I realised what I really want is just a really comfy oversized jumper which I think is a common thing for knitters to want. Um, but I love this colour. I do think it goes quite well with my skin tone. And I really want to cast this one on, but like I say, two at once. I will finish um, the, whatchamacallit, uh, the Afton Sol first. And then I will cast this one on. Um, I think this will be a nice easy knit because it's just stockinette. Um, and increases and decreases and all the other stuff. But in theory, it's just stockinette. So that's one thing I really want to cast on in the future. The next thing I want to cast on is the Seedenswanz by Frida Uxap. I keep saying Uxap, it's Uskap. Frida Uskap. And a lot, that's two patterns by her. So she's the designer between um who made the hechwe pattern and she also has a little waistcoat that i really want to make because it uses a lot of nutiden scraps which i have um i'll have a picture here of the pattern but i'd really love a little waistcoat to wear with high-waisted skirts i think that would be really cute and perfect for autumn spring weather so I don't know how I'm going to decide what order I cast these on in because I hadn't really looked into patterns that I wanted to make until this morning when I was preparing for this episode. Um, so I kind of did a deep dive into my favourites on Ravelry and, and on other threads looking for designs that I would like to make and I went a bit crazy, so now I have one, two, three, four, five things on my list. Um, so yeah, I think the other one is the Steinkrieger by Katrin, Katrin Hammer Designs. And this one I'm really excited for. So now that I've knit um, a jumper for Philip, um, well, nearly knit one, I can't say I've finished it yet. But now that I've <laughs> nearly finished that one, I really want to cast on another jumper for him. I'm really enjoying making things for my loved ones. Um, it's just really nice. Sometimes you just want to give your love back and giving people knitwear is very special. Um, and I really want to knit a chunky jumper. And I found the Steins Krieger jumper uh, on Ravelry and I'll put a picture here. It's a, I think it's knit on six millimeter needles, very large. I'm very excited because <laughs> it will be really quick. And after this four ply fiasco <laughs> that I've been making, I really want something quick and easy. And I love the design, how it's like the ocean. And it's knit in Alaphos which is a very chunky wool. And so I'm gonna get 
Alaphos Lopi, I think, because I'd love to try that wool. And I don't think I could spin anything that chunky. Um, my default spin is just tiny. I struggle to knit, like to spin DK weight, to be honest. Um, I like four ply, that's what I like to spin. That's just what happens if I lose concentration. If I have to knit or spin with chunky wool, yeah, it's just not something that comes naturally. I don't know why, it's just the way it is. So I want to use the scraps of this because I'll have some left, I think, after I've knit the hechwe. And yes, um, what's to say about it? I'll use this, I don't know if you can see in the picture, but there's like a light blue contrast with the dark blue and then the grey um, main colour. So I'll probably use up this as well as the Alaphos Lopi and I'll probably just hold it, I don't know how thick Alaphos Lopi is, but maybe I'll hold it double or with three, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. So that's another thing I really want to make. Um, I'm feeling super inspired really by knitting at the minute and even though it's getting warmer I feel like my inspiration is just getting more really um like i say i do love to knit in the summer outside um and i i just don't really see the point well i do see the point in knitting summer wear i guess i just don't tend to wear and um, summer wear knits that often maybe it's because i haven't knit any um but i just like to wear dresses and linen and um like flowy things in the summer and that's where I can sew so I can sew myself clothes in the summer and I just like to keep knitting for this very cold um, woolly season in autumn it just brings me a lot of joy um, so yeah I'm gonna cast those on at some point in the next few months We'll see how fast I am. Probably not very fast. Um, what else? Okay. I have a very short section on acquisitions and I am going to actually make myself a cup of tea last time because last time I said I was gonna do it, I didn't. I just filled it up with some more water. But I'm gonna make um, a herbal brew with a tea bag that Inga from Knitting Tradition sent me that I've been waiting to try um, because the tea bag was so pretty. Um, I didn't want to use it and not document it. <laughs> so I'm going to make that herbal tea, take a little break from my voice, and then we'll talk about some acquisitions. See you in a bit. Okay, I'm back with an actual steaming cup of tea. <laughs> because my other one was cold um yeah and I like hot tea because I'm just very I don't know I'm a naturally cold person even when it's sunny outside so I have a new cup of tea um and this is some tea that Inga sent me like I said and this one it is in part Norwegian, so <laughs> give me a minute. Um, I think this is ginger, turmeric, cinnamon, coriander, licorice root, cardamom and black pepper. The only one I'm not sure on is the one that I thought was turmeric. Don't know if that's handy. But anyway, it's a very sweet tea bag, like I say. Purely because of this part, I really like this little tag. I really wish all my tea bags had that on it. So this segues quite nicely into acquisitions because the lovely Inga sent me some Norwegian wool and some tea bags. And this was because I decided to send her, which she hasn't received yet due to some postal complications, but it is in the post to you. Um, I sent her a handmade mug because in one of her episodes 
I remember her saying um, she couldn't find many ceramic handmade mugs in Norway, so we have lots of lovely potters here in Edinburgh. So I sent her um, a mug and some other things like some tea and I won't say because I want it to be a surprise for her. Um, but I sent her some things and she wanted to send me some things back. So she sent me three skeins of Hillis Fog and this is their Ask base. And she sent three wonderful colors. And the best thing about having a friend like Inga is she has the same color palette as me. Um, and these are the colors she sent. They're so lovely and they feel amazing. Like they're rustic, but um, they're not scratchy. Um, and this is how many meters? 315 meters per skein, 100 grams. And I really want to knit with these, but I don't know what to make. So if anybody has any patterns that they think would look good in either three colours, two colours, um, then please put them in the description and I will cast something on. I'm thinking probably a colour work accessory or something. Um, there is a lot of wool here. This will be like over 900 metres, so could make something bigger if I wanted to. Um, what next? What else did I buy? I didn't buy lots to be honest. Other than the fleeces. Um, I actually do think there's only two things and one of them was sent to me. That is correct. Uh, well, other than the so the Nuti Den is an acquisition, to be fair. That, the things Inga sent me, and also this little needle case. So the reason I bought this was because I keep, well, I've lost all of my, like my sewing needles for knitting. So like the bigger ones for, for weaving in your ends. Cause I had a tiny little case for them and it was just so small and transparent and it got lost. So I figured if I bought a case for them with some new needles, because I didn't have any, um, that I'd be less likely to lose it because it's so decorative that I can put it on my shelves or um, on my bedside or something. And I feel like I'm more intentional with things like this than I am with just little plastic cases that things come in. Um, so hopefully, because of this, I won't lose my needles again, um, but we'll see. Well, that was a short trip uh, into acquisitions. Um, I, don't, I didn't actually buy that much. I haven't felt the need to buy much because all the projects I'm working on are mostly spinning projects and they just take so much time that I couldn't dream of casting anything else on um, at the moment. I've got so much that I've, I'm happy with and I'm very grateful for the things I already have in my stash. Um, not that I have a big stash. Um, I'm, well, like I say, I'm slow. So <laughs> because I'm slow, I don't have to, to buy things often. But I am going to the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase in Perth on the 2nd of April. I'll be going with um, people like um, Rebecca from the Crea Bea podcast. Amy Palco, um, uh, a lot of people from our knit night here in Edinburgh, which I'm lucky to be a part of because I've got to meet some lovely knitters. And like I say, fellow podcasters like Rebecca and Amy, um, that's been lovely. And yeah, I'm always in, my adm in admiration of their podcasts because they're so frequent and so inspired every single time um i'm a bit slower but that's fine because that's why you're here um i'm sure you're fine with the tempo my favorite podcasters only upload like three times a year or something like that and i'm quite happy with that i'd rather watch like a very nice uh big podcast than 
lots of frequent ones. Um, frankly, you'd be so bored if I did like weekly or fortnightly. I'd be like, hello everyone. All I've got to share is that I've knit two more rows on my jumper and you'd be like, okay, see you next week. And it would be quite boring, I think, for you. So it's better for me to do it in bigger chunks when I've got more to show you. And yeah, and then it gets me inspired to make the things that I've told you about because now people know. And yeah, that's always a good thing. So I've got two more things that I'd like to talk about. The first one being the retreats. So this is very exciting. Um, I'll try to get all the information in. So I am collaborating with the beautiful people at Barmolok Farm, um, which is about 20 minutes outside of Loch Ilpad, um, on the west coast of Scotland. And if you're my Patreons, you'll already know about this because my Patreons got first um, knowledge of it so they could book tickets in advance. And this is Scotland's Wild Medicine. This is a book that they wrote, um, Lilia Sinclair, who is a lovely, lovely human being. And if you come to the retreat, you'll get to meet her because, well, for two of the retreats, she'll be doing the food. Um, with organic food grown on the farm um, and she creates lovely wholesome meals and it's a beautiful place the land is alive with magic and it's very sacred land it's near some standing stones which you could go visit if you wanted to I can have a picture of them here very beautiful very beautiful if you want to experience Scotland and you've never been I would recommend coming along to one of these retreats because they encompass um, a lot more than just their subject. And yes, um, the first retreat is the Nettle Weekend and that's in July. All details would be below. Um, so that is going to be a weekend where we craft and we eat nettles. So <laughs> it sounds a bit basic, but it's going to be so much fun. So there'll be breath work meditation hosted by Lilia. Um, she is a master in taking control of your body and bringing you back down to earth. So she will be relaxing you with some uh, daily breath work and wild river swimming if you're interested. The first time I met Lilia, um, she managed to get me into an icy burn, which a burn is like um, a Scottish river, um, a term for a Scottish river, uh, if you don't know. Um, a rushing icy burn in November or October or something like that. Um, and I was like, no, not happening. And then we did some breath work with Lilia and I got in um, with a bunch of other women and we were around in a circle just chanting and <laughs> keeping warm in the freezing water um but it was lovely it was so special and because i met her there she was interested because i was a gardener and they needed some help um with their farm and then she realized that i was a crafter and she was really interested in hosting some crafting events so like I say, we'll have the, the breath work. She'll also be making a lot of food from nettles. So nettle cakes and soups and breads and sourdough. Like, she's wonderful with food. So you'll get to experience the nutrition of nettle. And then you'll have the side that I will be sharing, which is the crafting side. So we will be learning how to use the nettle fiber. So we'll be making nettle cordage I'll give you a complete crash course on how to do that, how to process the nettles even further if you're wanting to get the silver fibres for spinning, so how to spin with nettle, um, and also making a basket from the nettle cordage. So there's a lot in there. It'll be a really fun weekend of just connecting to people, connecting to the land, grounding ourselves. I'll be doing some nature meditations and some nature walks. We'll forage the nettles ourselves if there's any 
plants that you want to know about, you'll have great assistance. Um, so yeah, that's the first event and do consider coming along, that would be really fun. And the second event is the one I'm very excited for. So the second retreat is in August. I believe it's August 12th to, or August 13th to 15th. I can't remember the dates. It's, it's that weekend though, because the 14th of August is my birthday. So I'll be hosting this retreat on my birthday and Lilia's making me a nettle cake and it's all very exciting. <laughs> and uh, yes, so this is the ancestral craft retreat. Um, all about spinning and natural dyeing. So this retreat is all about learning how to take it from fleece to fiber to dyeing. It won't be a taut knitting retreat, so it's perfect if you already know how to knit, but you want to learn how to spin, how to prepare fibre. So we'll be having fleeces from the local sheep and I'll show you how to sort it, how to identify the different areas on the fleece, how to wash it, how to comb it or um, card it and how to spin it up. It'll be taught with jalagon spindles, so the little one here. Um, and all the materials you use, you can take home. So that's why the cost is maybe a bit higher than the nettle weekend, because you get to take home your spindle, all the samples of wool you'll get to try, all the hand dyed wool that you'll make, all of these things you can take home. And yeah, so that's a full weekend dying over a fire. Um, there'll be a ancestors ceremony by the fire where we can give our offerings and thanks and connect to our ancestors for this very this very precious skill that's been passed down to us and yes so that's the ancestral craft retreat all information is on the events page on the heel scotland website which will be linked below and do get your tickets in fast there's only 12 places for each event um, and that's because of the accommodation. They have beautiful um, holiday cottages. Um, so please, please, uh, if you're going to book that, do it sooner rather than later, because I ex there's already some places that are gone. Um, priority was given to the Patreons. We have a lovely Patreon who's coming all the way from Belgium. Um, we have more people from the Heal Scotland side of things where I did a live over on their Facebook page. If you want to see the live we did talking about the events, there's a couple of people that have booked from that. So there are, are only minimal spaces left. So if you want to come, do get on it soon because the reach on this podcast is a lot bigger um, than where I've shared it previously. So I hope to see some of you there. And that is retreats. Okay. So I want to say that the winner of the giveaway, so last um, episode, there was a giveaway for this Jalagon spindle that was hand carved and I burned a little oam into it and some elderberry dyed wool. And I did a random comment picker. I'll put the screenshot on the, on the, the screen so you can see and the winner is willow and wool so willow and wool you can read their lovely comment about how they connect to willow here and if you are that person please contact me on facebook instagram ravelry wherever make contact um and i will uh send that out to you thank you to everybody who commented though because it was a beautiful comment section to read. It warms my heart to see so many people connecting to plants in many different ways. Lots of beautiful personal stories about how they connect to places, to people, to a time, to their childhood, to their ancestors, to their homelands. It's really beautiful to read all your stories. And thank you for sharing the deeply personal ones about family members that are no longer here and things that might be more painful to talk about. Thank you for sharing because it really reaffirms that nature is 
a wonderful healer and yeah it just makes me so happy to hear all these interesting connections hear about plants i've never heard of because they're not native to me or they're not commonly planted here in gardens it's just been wonderful so thank you and if you haven't read through the comments section i would read it um because it's just so lovely and if i haven't responded to you i'm so sorry <laughs> but there are so many comments and I tried to sit down a few occasions and go through them all, but I, there's just so many. But I have read them all. Every time I get a little notification, I do read them. Um, so thank you, everybody, for that. Your support is magical. I was on the floor the whole time. I got sent... Who was this by? The name... I think it was Amy. Amy from Montreal, Canada. She makes stitch markers and she kindly sent me these and these are foraging <laughs> stitch markers and they're so cute very precious so there's a little cup it's not the best way to show them at all so there's a little cup here then there's a little mushroom And then a little acorn in the most beautiful little packaging. So thank you, Amy, for sending me these. I haven't used them yet because I wanted to show them first. And I almost didn't show them because I'm terrible. But now I get to use these and I'm very excited to use the little cup. Um, that brings me joy. And um, so thank you. And the last thing I really wanted to mention was um if you are wanting to find things in the future from me like uh, show notes or um, a forum or my links or events then i am working on a website well i'm not my partner is lovingly making a website for me uh, that i can use to have everything in one place um so you can, you'll be able to find me there in the future. But for now, you can always find me on Instagram, Ravelry, Patreon, YouTube. Um, and that's about it. That's a good amount. Um, so yeah, please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much for this long episode that's gone everywhere. And I really hope you guys are enjoying the spring. You've enjoyed the winter. Um, keep loving the outside. The bumblebees are coming out of hibernation. Everything's starting to flower. It's, it's a great time and I will leave you with some footage of the gardens I'm at and things like that. I haven't decided what I'll show you so have fun <laughs> watching some nice pictures and videos. Um, and I hope you all keep well. I'm sending lots of warm hugs and wishes and I hope you all enjoy your knitting and your crafting in this beautiful transient liminal time before spring is in full force. Please do think about joining me on Patreon if you want to hear more from me. I might only pop up on YouTube every three months or something, but Patreon you will hear and see a lot more of me. So please consider that. Um, sending lots of love and see you next time. Thank you, Inga, for this tea. It's so nice. <laughs>